The Wild Fishes Review said that one of its main aims was to have evidence-based management for salmon in Scotland. However, for one of its main proposals, the licensing of the killing of salmon, it provided no evidence and nor has it any been published subsequently. So the purpose of this short paper is to see what evidence there is relating to kill licensing for the tweed. Now the first point is that anglers only catch a small proportion of the summer and autumn salmon that come into the tweed. Spring, yes, that can be a high proportion, quarter or so. For autumn, it's less than 5%. For summer, however, we're having difficulty in getting a good figure because these results are based on netting and tagging salmon at the bottom of the river and then finding out how many are caught by anglers upstream. But due to the variability of water flows in summer, this is proving difficult for that season. In a wet summer, we can't manage to net and tag the fish, whereas in a dry summer, although the netting is easy, the tagged fish stick at the bottom of the river and don't move much. So for the rest of this paper, we'll only be looking at the autumn fish, September, October and November. Now there's not as much data on the exploitation rate of salmon by anglers that you might think there should be. The best is from the Welsh Dee, where there's a fish trap at Chester. And that shows that in March and April, with spring salmon, the exploitation rate, the catch rate by anglers, can indeed be very significant, 40% or so. In summer, in June, July and August, it's about 20%, but in September and October, it falls to the sort of 10 and 5% levels that we can see on the tweed. Now, if we look at the September to November fish and try and estimate the total run, we see that the average catch from 2000 to 2014 is just over 9,000. Now, although the headline catch rate is around about 5%, there are some caveats to add to that. Some Tagged fish may not be reported when caught, uh, some tags may be lost, some fish may drop out of the river after tagging. So to be on the safe side, we take a 10% catch rate for autumn fish. And if we apply that to the catches, you get a total run of just over 90,000 autumn fish. Now, if all 10% that we estimate were, that were caught, were killed, that would still leave us with 82,000 fish or so, 90% of the run. Now most grills are male, so if we assume that 40% of these are female, that gives 32,000 female fish to spawn. And at 4,000 eggs each, that gives just over 130 million eggs deposited by autumn salmon. If no fish were killed at all, if that 10% were also not killed, there would be 14 million more eggs, about 11% more. This is because <coughs> of the reproductive system of salmon. They are not like mammals. With mammals you need to get a lot of young, you need a lot of parents. But with fish and with insects, only a few parents can give huge numbers of young. So, as shown in the last slide, the cycle starts with a huge number of eggs, far more than the river can actually support. So what happens, you get a self-thinning process, as it's called, that reduces the numbers that hatch down to the numbers that the food and space can actually support. The self-thinning becomes uh, less dramatic, fry to par and then you come to the smolt stage and those smolts have to of course go down the river make the transition to salt water in the estuary go to sea and return now the number of adults returning is actually the minimum number in the whole cycle of the salmon but 
the next stage after that is back to the eggs and there's an explosion of numbers from that minimum number of adults to the maximum number which is the maximum number of eggs. So kill licensing is actually trying to intervene at the strongest link in the life cycle, this explosion in numbers from adults to eggs. Logically, however, the place to try and intervene in the cycle is at its weakest point, which is the number of smolts. They have to get down the river, and then they have to make that transition to salt water. And of course, the more smolts that set out, the more smolts that survive the river and estuary, the more adults will come back. And with the new technology of small acoustic tags, it has been shown in a number of studies already that smoke losses going down the river can be very large, more than 50%. And again, in the estuary, the smoke losses can be very large, up to 80% in one Canadian study. So this really is the weakest point of the life cycle. This is the logical place to try and intervene. And we can see this self-thinning process in action in this photograph, which shows three salmon fry from the leader water. One of them is 70-something millimetres long, the others are half that size, even though they've only been hatched for a few months. Now this difference in size has come about because the large fry is a winner. It has got itself a territory, it's feeding and growing. The two little ones are losers. They've not managed to get them territories. They're living a sort of hole-in-the-corner existence, skulking away whenever a larger fish turns up. They're not feeding much, they're not growing, in fact they're not much bigger than when they came out of the gravel. And of course at that small size they're much more vulnerable to predation. Even a small trout or a small eel can eat a 30 millimeter fry. Now if you add more spawners all you get is more losers. You don't get more winners because the food and space limit fry numbers, not the number of spawning adults. Just because more adults spawn doesn't mean there's more food and space in the river to support the extra young. Now there's some evidence from what are called overstocking experiments where unnatural levels of fry or eggs are stocked into a stream, that if you start off with really too many fish, you could end up with fewer survivors at the end of the season than if you had started with fewer. This is probably because the stress of such violent struggle for survival will kill off fish that would otherwise have been winners at lower densities. Now, the third sort of evidence on this issue is to do with the estimation of the quotas that would be applied to each river, uh, which would give a total number of fish that could be killed. These are to be based on catches, but the fact is that catches are not good short-term guide to stocks. Over a longer period, yes, they will reflect stocks, but over a short period, no. One year's catches really don't tell you anything about next year's catches. Indeed, nor do the two or three years previous catches either. And this is illustrated here with two uh, columns of data. On the left, there is the catches of the North East England drift nets, catch per licensed day, which is to say catch per unit effort. And you can see in that column that these run to five to eight fish per day, usually. But in 2010, 2011, there was a huge jump in the catches, showing a much larger number of fish available. Now in the centre, we've got the tweed rod catches in autumn, and you can see that they're relatively stable too, but in 2010, there was a huge jump to numbers not seen before. And that obviously matches with the extra large catches made by the drift nets. But in 2011, when the drift nets caught even more fish, the rod catches in the tweed dropped by half. And this is a demonstration that rod catches don't just reflect the numbers of fish in the river, they're also affected by 
obviously the weather, but also by the behaviour of the fish themselves. Because if a, f a lot of fish come in early, they will become stale and uncatchable in the river. The ideal situation for rod catches is to have the fish coming in in blocks through the season so that there's always fresh fish to catch. Whereas if they all come in at once, which is more or less what happened in 2011, they go stale and uncatchable in the river, and it doesn't matter how many fish they are, they can't be caught. And we can illustrate this with more data from the netting and tagging at the bottom of the river. This graph shows the days elapsing between fish being tagged at the bottom and being recaptured by anglers further upstream. And actually, half the recaptures are made within one month of the fish being tagged at the bottom of the river, and 90% of recaptures are made within two months. After two months, as far as the fishery is concerned, a fish might as well not be in the river. And this shows how the, as I said before, how the behaviour of the fish coming into the river can affect catches. If there's fresh fish coming in in blocks through the season, the total catch will be high because it's always fresh and catchable fish in the river. If all the autumn fish come in in a mass at the beginning of the autumn, they'll just go off and stale and uncatchable in the river and the total catch will be lower, as it would appear happened in 2011. And in fact, this going stale and uncatchable in the river could be regarded as a sort of natural kill licensing. Uh, the fish, if you like, become protected the longer they stay in the river. They're less and less likely to be caught. Uh, it is a big mistake to think that fish remain catchable at the same level all the time they are in fresh water. So the conclusion is, first of all, there's no evidence that kill licensing would be of any value for the treat. In other words, more spawners will not mean any strengthening of the population. Secondly, it's actually aimed at the wrong part of the life cycle of the salmon to have any useful effect.